I have question number one from Finlay Carson. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met with Dumfries and Galloway Council and what was discussed. Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Ministers and officials regularly meet representatives of all Scottish local authorities, including Dumfries and Galloway, uh, to discuss a range of issues as part of our commitment to working in partnership with local government to improve outcomes for the people of Scotland. On the 13th of September, the Cabinet Secretary for the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work met the South of Scotland Alliance, including the leader of Dumfries and Galloway Council, to discuss the establishment of the South of Scotland Enterprise Agency. Finlay Carson. Thank the Minister for that response. It's been announced this month that a number of regeneration projects look to set, uh, receive financial support from Dumfries and Galloway Council's Town Centre Living Fund. Can the Minister tell us what support the Government is providing to encourage people to move back into town centres and towns in Dumfries and Galloway to reverse decline and boost much needed economic development? Minister. Uh, the Government has been very supportive of the town centre first principle, presiding officer, um, which uh, is a matter for local authorities to bring forward. And I would expect local authorities to look at their local planning and ensuring uh, that the town for, for, uh, centre first principle applies. Uh, Mr Carson will probably be aware that I was recently um, in Dumfries to discuss with uh, uh, citizens uh, and stakeholders there uh, uh, around about their town centre. Uh, and I was very pleased to hear uh, that citizen-led approach, uh, which I think has actually led Dumfries and Galloway Council into creating that fund uh, and investing in town centres. So I would encourage them to continue to do so. Uh, and of course, the government will continue to support uh, them through the town centre first principle. Joe McAlpine. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, can I uh, commend the Dumfries Town Centre initiative that is indeed citizen-led, as the Minister has said, and thank the Minister for the great interest he's shown into it. Does the Minister agree with me that one of the, the big barriers to developing town centres for housing and, and, and other purposes is the, the VAT that's levied on uh, the restoration of buildings con compared to the zero VATed status of new out-of-town developments? Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, I thank Ms McAlpine for her question. Uh, and I'm sure that she and other members have heard me uh, in this chamber on a number of occasions uh, calling on the UK government to actually get rid of that VAT uh, on repairing of uh, houses. Um, I think that that would go a, a long way in bringing lots and lots of buildings back into use. Um, it seems a bit of anomaly that there is no VAT on new build, uh, but VAT on repairs to existing properties. And I do hope that at some point the UK government will listen to what we've had to say in this and will actually uh, get, eradicate that VAT so that we can bring more properties back into use in Dumfries and in other parts of Scotland. Question number two, John Mason. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what consideration it is giving to how tenement housing can be better maintained. Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, responsibility for maintaining tenements is principally the responsibility of the owners and is usually governed by rules and conditions set out in the title deeds for the flats within the block. The Tenement Scotland Act 2004 provides a structure known as the Tenant Management Scheme for the maintenance and management of tenements. The Housing Scotland Act 2006 gave local authorities discretionary powers to require owners to carry out work in substandard houses and to provide assistance with repairs and improvements to private property. The Housing Scotland Act 2014 amended these powers to make them more effective, including new provisions to allow local authorities to pay missing shares for work carried agreed by a majority of owners in a tenement. In the private rented sector, the new private residential tenancy comes into effect in December of this year. This will significantly improve tenant security and better enable tenants to exercise their right to report a breach of the repairing standard to the Housing and Property Chamber of the First Tier Tribunal. John Mason. Yeah, I thank the Minister for a very full answer. I mean, I take his point about title deeds, but I wonder if he would agree with me that some title deeds do not have any provision for a factor and it then becomes very difficult for owner-occupiers or landlords of private tenants to get together, to organise things and to carry out repairs. And perhaps there is a need for a, ensuring that there is a factor in place for every single tenement. Minister. Uh, President Officer, the, the Scottish Government agrees that owners of tenements should ideally plan ahead uh, for 
uh, future common repairs and maintenance. And property factors can play a, an important role in ensuring that repairs are made and therefore the property is maintained. However, the services of a factor come at a cost uh, and some homeowners uh, would not welcome the need to hand over sums of money uh, into a sinking fund for repairs not required at that particular point in time. And I would encourage homeowners to work together to share, share the responsibility of looking after their properties, uh, but to legislate to require a factor or sinking funds uh, would place an additional financial burden on homeowners who currently do not have these in place and may be difficult to enforce. And can I refer all members uh, in the chamber today to have a look at the Under the One Roof website, which can be Im immensely beneficial in helping uh, 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 property owners in terms of dealing with some of the issues uh, that Mr Mason has raised today. Graham Simpson. Thank you. Um, I'm hosting uh, or sponsoring an event uh, on this very issue uh, next week and there is uh, a cross-party interest in it. Uh, I know Ben McPherson uh, has tabled a motion which I've signed uh, on this very issue. Um, uh, I wonder if the Minister would agree with the call from the uh, RICS uh, that there should be tenement health checks uh, and does he think that uh, there is a need for further legislation? I asked him a question, a uh, written question um, uh, recently um, uh, about whether the, uh, the powers that he mentioned that councils have uh, are being used. Um, he referred me to councils. So I've done an FOI, I'll be revealing the figures next week. He's welcome to come along and hear them to see just how effective or ineffective that legislation is. Minister. Um, thank you, President Officer, and I thank Mr Simpson for his invitation. Um, I cannot say here and now whether I'll be able to attend or not, but I'll, I've taken note of, of that invitation. Um, can, I, can I say to Mr Simpson, um, that one of the things which I am absolutely adamant about is to ensure that local authorities use the legislation that is currently at their disposal. Um, I do not see um, the point in uh, coming up with a raft of new legislation when that may not be required uh, when current legislation is not used. And I um, actually thank him uh, for his support. Um, in trying to ensure that councils actually use the powers that are currently at their disposal. Uh, beyond that, um, the government itself uh, has looked at a number of things and we, we're actually running uh, an area-based pilot uh, of equity loan schemes to assist owners to carry out uh, essential repairs and energy efficiency improvements in Glasgow, Perthshire and uh, Argyll and Butte. And I will look um, at the findings from that pilot uh, and see if there is uh, a, a need to establish or, or sufficient demand to establish support uh, for procurement of a nationwide scheme in the future as part of the development of Scotland's energy efficiency programme to continue to upgrade Scotland's tenement properties. Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I thank John Mason for raising this question on an important but often overlooked issue. And while I agree with the Minister that, that not all solutions are necessarily legislative, I also agree with them that we have to help owners come together. So can I ask what uh, activity the government has undertaken to work with credit unions to help, uh, who could potentially help owners come together in terms of collective savings, collective loans, and potentially invoice factoring, which could help um, the financing of much needed repairs to tenement buildings? Minister. I thank uh, Mr Johnson for that question and I think he's um, come up with a, a particularly good idea. I, I'm more than willing to talk to, to credit unions uh, around about uh, them providing help if that is at all possible. Uh, beyond that, as I, I said earlier, you know, we will look uh, at uh, all possible solutions and that's one of the reasons why we're running the pilot that we are at this moment in time uh, which is helpful to those that maybe cannot um, afford the repairs at that point in time and allows us to take an equity stake in that property uh, and we will get the money back uh, in the future but I'm more than willing to, to take on board uh, Mr Johnson's suggestion about approaching credit unions um, and I will uh, let him know how I get on in that regard. And Linda Fabiani. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. May I ask the Minister to bear in mind when undertaking any review of tenement law or of maintenance and guidance that it's not always very old buildings, red sandstone that we often think about, 
but in new towns like East Kilbride and some of the peripheral housing estates, we have tenements for it, which are of a much more modern fabric. That brings its own um, questions and its own problems when it's been right to buy in particular, because you can end up with mixed tenure of local authority, of owners and indeed private landlords, some of whom are not always willing to take their part. It then leads to severe factoring problems and with many owners feeling that they neither get good value for money nor good social value. And could this be looked at as well? Thank you. Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I'm well aware uh, that Ms Fabiani has raised a number of points about property factors and new developments in, uh, in recent times. And there is provision in the Title Condition Scotland Act 2003 on manager burdens and title deeds. Uh, and these are typically used by a developer to appoint a factor in the initial years of a housing development. Um, I know that uh, Ms Fabiani has an interest in this, so I would also say to her that once the manager burden has expired, the owners of flats and a tenement do have rights to act together to dismiss and appoint a, a new property factor. Um, I will continue to, to work with uh, Linda Fabiani and other members, uh, presiding officer, uh, to try and improve these, the situation. And once again, I would ask all members to have a look at the Under One Roof website. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of the impact uh, on people in Scotland of the UK Government's extended benefit cap? Minister Jean Freeman. Thank you. The latest figures from the Department of Work and Pensions show that at May 2017, around 3,700 households containing over 11,000 children were subject to the benefit cap in Scotland, losing on average £57 per week. Almost two-thirds of these households are lone parents, with around three-quarters having a child under five years old. The Scottish Government, of course, continues to oppose the benefit cap, which is clearly impacting hardest on low-income families with children, and that is why we have repeatedly called on the UK Government to reverse this policy. Patrick Harvey. Uh, thank you. I certainly would echo the, the call on the UK Government to reverse this uh, and a long list of its other vindictive and unnecessary welfare changes. And while this Parliament and the Scottish Government should not be left with a position of merely mitigating uh, the, the effect of these decisions. The Scottish Government does have a role in protecting people. It has currently allocated £8 million for mitigation of the benefit cap, and yet we've shown that the gap, uh, the, the reduction in overall spend through the benefit system as a result, is £11 million. Given that the impact on households is even more severe than with the bedroom tax, and yet the overall budgetary impact of fully mitigating would be less, uh, isn't it clear that the Scottish Government should uh, strain every sinew to fill this, this gap, which currently stands at just £3 million? And wouldn't that make a massive difference for people in Scotland who are affected by this policy? Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm, I'm grateful to the member for his supplementary question. Can I, can I just say gently and respectfully that whilst I completely agree with him that it is not the role of this government or indeed this parliament to merely mitigate the worst effects of what the UK government's policies inflict on the people we represent, um, it is a little ironic that he then goes on to suggest that we do precisely that. Future spending is a matter for the budget, and as Mr Harvey uh, rightly says, we have allocated £8.1 million to local authorities for DHPs to mitigate, in part, the damaging impact of lowering the benefit cap. That's a £6 million increase on the DWP allocation last year, and of course local authorities retain discretion to top up the DHP funds. As I've said, future spending is a matter for the budget, and allocation of DHPs will be discussed uh, by Scottish Government with COSLA. We are very happy to hear suggestions for both the DHP allocation and overall spending, but I would say that those suggestions should also come with suggestions of how additional funding commitments can be met. Adam Tompkins. Thank you, Presiding Officer. If the Scottish Government is so concerned about the effect of the benefit cap in Scotland, why is there no provision in the Minister's Social Security Bill uh, to deal with this? And in particular, why is there no provision in that bill to provide for the creation of new benefits, which was a key part of the Smith Commission package on welfare devolution? Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Well, we're certainly up in the irony stakes uh, in this uh, portfolio question time. I, I, I am 
uh, almost speechless, but not quite. Um, it is the case, as Mr Tompkins well knows, that ministers have the powers to create new benefits. Indeed, that is precisely what we are doing in replacing the Sure Start grant with our Best Start grant, bringing a considerable financial increase in support to uh, mothers and not only the first child, but all subsequent children, unlike the UK government, which stops at the first child only. So Mr Tompkins is quite wrong to say that there is somehow uh, some uh, failing in our condemnation of what the UK government is doing around the benefit cap. And indeed, I concur completely with Mr Harvey. There are many other areas of the UK government's welfare approach that require condemnation, if only they would but listen to us. Uh, but he is quite wrong. Uh, to suggest that we are deliberately and willfully choosing not to act in that regard. We do not require our Social Security Bill to provide us with powers that we already have. Question number four, Edward Mountain. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what recent meetings the Cabinet Secretary has had with the community representatives in Caithness regarding concerns about the removal of services. Cabinet Secretary, Angela Constance. Signing officer, Scottish Government ministers regularly meet with the community representatives right across Scotland, uh, including the Highland Council area, on a range of issues as part of our commitment to work in partnership uh, to improve outcomes for the people of Scotland. Edward Mount. Um, thank you, presiding officer. I'm not sure that answered the question. Uh, it was just that there were regular meetings. The Cabinet Secretary, but not with the people in Caithness and, and not necessarily by the Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary will agree, I'm sure, with me that building communities is something we should all embrace. Communities add strength and cohesion to society. If she really wants to build and support communities, surely she needs to speak out against the possible closure of local hospitals, the possible downgrading of palliative care, the reduction of the number of residential care beds, the amalgamation of GP services, the reduction in public services. Will she join me in speaking out against these, which help only to fragment communities like the communities in Caithness. Cabinet Secretary. Um, presiding officer, I would have thought uh, Mr Mountain would have been better to have addressed uh, the substantive part uh, of his question to uh, the, the, health, the Health Secretary. Uh, but nonetheless, from the point of view from uh, my portfolio, um, the Community uh, Planning, Community Empowerment Act uh, has given community planning partnerships uh, new statutory duties. Uh, we work very closely uh, with local government and our wider partners uh, across the public service uh, to look at how we can improve uh, decision-making arrangements, uh, strengthen local democracy, uh, protect and renew public services, and refresh uh, the relationship between uh, citizens, uh, communities, and councils. Question number five, Graham D. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to support disabled people in light of the paper published by the UN in October 2017, which sets out its concluding observations on its initial report about UK reforms. Minister Jean Freeman. The UN's concluding observations recognise the positive steps that the Scottish Government is taking, including the publication of our Disability Action Plan involving disabled people in building a new social security system, and these are, of course, welcome. Now, in Scottish Government, we uh, have begun a review of that action plan against those concluding observations, and we'll move on to discuss with disabled people and organisations that represent them what we need to do to align our work to the areas highlighted by the UN. And indeed, I began that discussion this morning. In addition, I have written to the UK Government to ask them what they will do to address the concerns uh, highlighted by the UN, in particular personal independence, payment regulations, employment and support allowance sanctions, and to involve disabled people in assessing UK Government policies which will impact on their lives. Graham D. Thank you. The Minister will be aware that there is a recommendation to, and I quote, ensure that legislation provides for the right to high quality sign language interpretation and other forms of alternative communication in all spheres of life for deaf persons and hard of hearing persons in accordance with the Convention. Can she advise how the Scottish Government will seek to ensure it complies with this? Minister. Thank you. As the Member will know, the British Sign Language Scotland Act it was uh, 
passed and received royal assent in 2015. And members, I'm sure, will know that in following that up, we've published our first uh, BSL national plan yesterday, the first such plan in the UK. We also recognise that delivering many of the improvements we want to see depend on the availability of qualified BSL English interpreters uh, with the right skills and experience. And so the Scottish Funding Council is already supporting an MA in BSL uh, English interpreting. And over the next two years, we will sponsor two new training programmes, one at Harriet Watt and one at Queen Margaret University, designed to support interpreters to work in the specialist fields of health, mental health and justice. We have also introduced and funded the first nationally funded BSL online interpreting video relay service. And finally, we fund an inclusive communication website that provides tools and guidance on how to make information accessible. Question number six, Monica Lennon. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what action it takes to monitor and protect the social and human rights of young people. Cabinet Secretary. Officer, we remain committed to enhancing children's rights in all aspects of Scottish life. The Children and Young People Scotland Act 2014 places duties on Scottish ministers to consider how to give better or further effect uh, to the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child and report every three years what steps they have taken uh, and what they plan to do in the following three years. The first report, which will include input uh, from children and young people, is due in 2018. The Scottish Government also reports progress through the UK State Party report to the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child uh, in line uh, with the committee cycles. Children's rights and wellbeing impact assessments ensure that all portfolios uh, consider the interests of children in developing new additions, new initiatives. Uh, in addition, President Officer, the Programme for Government made clear uh, our uh, plans for a comprehensive audit on the most effective and practical ways to further embed the principles uh, of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child into policy and legislation, including the option uh, of full incorporation into domestic law. Monica Lennon. Thank you. I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's response. An anti-loitering device known as the Mosquito, which emits a high-pitched sound affecting young people, has recently been installed at Hamilton Central Station in, in Central Scotland region, but it's not an isolated case. This device indiscriminately affects all young people and has been roundly condemned, roundly condemned by both the Scottish Youth Parliament and the Children and Young People's Commissioner as being in breach of their human rights. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that these devices have no place in a civilised society and that a ban on the mosquito is the only way forward to protect the social and human rights of our youngest citizens? Cabinet Secretary. So, you know, so I agree with Ms Lennon that these devices have no place in Scotland and she might be aware that Annabel Ewan, the Minister for Legal Affairs and Community Safety, uh, wrote to uh, all local authorities, uh, wrote to public bodies and also, uh, crucially, I think, given our constituents' interest, uh, ScotRail. Um, in short, uh, the Scottish Government, we are opposed to the use uh, of these mosquito anti-loitering uh, devices. We don't believe there is a need. Uh, we don't believe they're effective and they don't sit well with our approach to tackling antisocial uh, behaviour. Uh, and also, from my perspective, I ve do very much note uh, the concerns and views of the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child uh, and their concerns uh, about whether um, and how uh, measures such as these devices uh, breach the rights uh, of children and young people. So we are currently uh, looking at the evidence from a, a survey of Young Scots done through uh, Young Scot. Uh, there was nearly 800 replies uh, to that survey uh, and the, the response to uh, Ms Ewan's correspondence uh, will be very important uh, as we consider uh, what further action we may wish to take. Michelle Ballantyne. Thank you, Presiding Officer. National Care Leavers Week runs until the 28th of October. Leaving care is a life-altering and often very difficult time for a young person. So can I ask, what action is the Scottish Government taking to promote young people's right, uh, rights around continuing care and after care? And what, how are these rights being effectively enforced to, produce, to protect the welfare of these often very vulnerable young people? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you very much, uh, President Officer, and I, and I thank uh, the member for that uh, question. Of course, the Children and Young People Act uh, was landmark legislation that did indeed introduce new responsibilities uh, to the through and after care of looked after children. Uh, but the, the essence of her uh, point is that these children uh, are, are our children, uh, they are Scotland's parents, uh, and if you know, people like me think they've only got uh, one child, uh, they need to think again uh, in that we have that parental uh, 
uh, responsibility uh, towards uh, all of our looked after children uh, who are among some of the most disadvantaged uh, young people in our society. Uh, there's a wealth of work taken forward by education ministers, the children and young pe persons uh, minister in particular, uh, and there's work uh, that's spearheaded by our own uh, First Minister that in essence is about ensuring that our looked after young people at the end of the day uh, we improve their life chances and life opportunities but actually at the end of the day uh, like our children uh, they feel loved and wanted and that we our responsibility is to have the same uh, hopes, dreams and ambitions uh, for these children uh, as we do our own. Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Minister further clarify the Government's progress towards undertaking a comprehensive audit on further embedding the principles of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child into policy and legislation? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Presiding Officer, I think given that uh, next year, uh, looking ahead, is the, the year of the, the, the young people, um, it's um, important that we uh, relook and refresh how we actually uh, listen to the voices of young people uh, and embed those voices of young people uh, in all areas uh, of our political uh, and civic rights. So in terms of uh, Ms Mackay's question, it is important uh, that we adopt a fully uh, participatory uh, process in taking uh, our commitment uh, forward in terms of uh, the audit that she, she, she mentions. Um, she may be interested to, to know that initial scoping work is underway uh, and that includes discussions uh, with stakeholders on the best way uh, to include children and young people uh, in this very important uh, process. Uh, and as outlined in last month's uh, programme for government, uh, the audit will start in 2018. Question number seven, Miles Briggs. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to encourage more people to carry out voluntary work in their communities. Cabinet Secretary. Officer, the programme for government recognises the very vital role volunteers play in shaping Scotland and the positive contribution they make to our society. We have set out our commitment to reinvigorate volunteering in Scotland, building on positive trends for youth engagement and continuing to support people in their volunteering. Uh, in June, I announced £3.8 million over the next four years uh, for the Volunteer Support Fund to promote uh, community-led volunteering with a particular focus on engaging volunteers from disadvantaged groups. Uh, in addition, we continue to provide direct funding to Volunteer Scotland uh, and to the 32 third sector interfaces to encourage, promote and support volunteers uh, and volunteering to communities across Scotland. Well, that's great. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. And is the Cabinet Secretary aware of the recent research from Ed M Volunteer Edinburgh that indicates that the number of adults in the capital here who volunteer is continuing to rise and is now at 35%, one of, the, one of the highest rates in Scotland. But what specific action can be taken to encourage people who haven't volunteered to give their time to charities and other organisations, especially men in Scotland, to get them involved? As there's a clear lack of male volunteering in Scotland, particularly being reported by some charities who are looking um, to male befrienders to work with ser service users. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, I think the point that Mr Briggs makes about uh, male uh, befrienders is uh, an important one. It is indeed encouraging to hear those statistics in terms of the higher participation in adult uh, volunteering in the city of Edinburgh. Uh, the average across uh, Scotland is 27%, so um, he is, is right to uh, applaud uh, the, the civic uh, efforts uh, of uh, the city. Uh, it is undoubtable that the, the biggest gift we can give anyone uh, is the gift of our time, um, and people volunteer without fuss, fanfare uh, or reward and we need to be clear that volunteering very much is the golden thread uh, through the, the, the fabric uh, of our society. In terms of what more we can do, uh, I think uh, MSPs of all shades have uh, responsibilities to uh, talk about the value of volunteering in terms of how it uh, benefits actually £2 billion to our economy. Uh, I think it enables volunteers themselves to upskill, to perhaps increase um, you know, their wellbeing and their employability. And in terms of the work that this government will take forward, uh, we will be developing a framework uh, that very much looks at, at corralling uh, the evidence of the value of volunteering so that there is a, a coherent, compelling narrative that identifies the key outcomes that we all want to achieve with key data and evidence and that we'll be able to have an informed debate uh, about the interventions uh, that are most appropriate and successful. Question number eight, Ben McPherson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the work of the Homelessness and Rough Sleeping Action Group. Minister Kevin Stewart. 
Thank you, President Officer. Uh, the Short Life Homelessness and Rough Sleeping Action Group met for the first time on the 5th of October and immediately started work on its first objective of what we can all do to minimise rough sleeping this winter. The Action Group will report back shortly on this issue. Its other object ob objectives are to provide recommendations on ending rough sleeping longer term, transforming temporary accommodation and ending homelessness in Scotland. In November, they will be meeting as part of a much larger event involving other partners. Ben McPherson. I thank the Minister for that update and welcome the, the progress of the group. Can the Minister also set out how the Scottish Government is working with Edinburgh City Council in particular to address the standard of temporary accommodation here in Edinburgh and the supply of affordable housing for those moving on from temporary accommodation. Minister. President officer, um, one of the Homelessness and Rough Sleeping Action Group's main objectives will be to make recommendation and recommendations on how we can transform temporary accommodation in Scotland. Currently, 82% of folk in temporary accommodation are in mainstream social housing, and I would like to see that number uh, rise. Of course, all of this is against the background of uh, UK government welfare cuts, uh, which means less funding is available for temporary accommodation. Uh, but we're already committed to ensuring that all of that accommodation is the same standard as permanent accommodation. The Action Group, of course, will work with local authorities such as the City of Edinburgh Council to ensure temporary accommodation plays a positive role in moving people on from homelessness. And we'll also continue to work with local authorities on this issue uh, longer term uh, through the group and beyond. Uh, and we want time and temporary accommodation to be as short as possible. Uh, and we are increasing housing supply to help with that. Uh, over this parliamentary period, the Scottish Government has allocated affordable housing supply programme funding of nearly £190 million to the City of Edinburgh, which we expect to deliver around 4,000 houses, primarily focusing on the social rented sector. Pauline McNeill. Thank you, Presiding Officer. There has been a rise in rough sleeping the last two winters. And I don't expect that this winter will be any different. I know we're all concerned about that. But can the Minister say today whether they can, he can take any immediate action, given we know we're going to face it this winter? Um, there's significant resources used by charities such as the Bethany Trust and the City Mission. Is there anything the Scottish Government can do this coming winter, as we know that there literally, sadly, will be hundreds of people sleeping and freezing on the streets of Scotland? Minister. Um, President Officer, as I stated in my earlier answer, one of the key objectives of, of the Action Group is to look at what we need to do this winter. Um, already we have the winter shelter open here in Edinburgh. Um, I understand that the winter shelter opened in Glasgow just the other week because of the weather conditions that there were uh, during the course of Storm Ophelia. Um, the, the Action Group are looking at this very carefully indeed to see exactly uh, what we need to do over the course of this winter. The Government will of course look uh, very carefully at all of the recommendations uh, that the Group uh, put forward uh, and we will take action accordingly. And I agree completely and utterly with Pauline McNeill that it's unacceptable uh, for folk to have to sleep rough. And I do wish that the UK Government uh, would change its policies in terms of social security cuts which are putting more and more folk at risk of having to sleep in the streets. Question number nine, Rachel Hamilton. To ask the Scottish Government how it ensures that rural and urban communities receive equal support. Cabinet Secretary Angela Constance. President Officer, the Scottish Government seeks to support all of Scotland, rural and urban, to create inclusive economic growth and development. We fund local authorities based on an assessment of needs rather than geography which ensures that local authorities receive their fair share and that the specific needs of urban and rural areas are considered. We recognise that rural communities have unique challenges uh, which require specific support and interventions. Uh, this is why we have Highlands and Islands Enterprise and why we are creating a South of Scotland Enterprise Agency to respond to the challenges faced in these primarily rural areas. Rachel Hammond. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Um, you have actually mentioned uh, the rural and urban support specifically. However, the member will know that mobility is a lot harder in rural areas than is in urban areas. And with cuts to local council budgets, it's even harder for older people to get around rural constituencies like the Scottish borders. 
How will the Scottish Government work to ensure that older people can keep their independence without being cut off from society? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign officer, uh, Ms Hamlet's question touches on um, a, a, an area that's a good example of uh, cross-portfolio working. And she may be aware that uh, Ms Freeman, the Minister for Social Security, is uh, currently working on a social isolation strategy. And while I should stress that social isolation isn't just an issue uh, for older people, there are huge issues uh, for some of our younger people as well and uh, other, other, other groups. Uh, but that uh, strategy uh, will look at how we can ensure to have a good cross-government endeavour and some of the issues uh, that she uh, raises. Uh, the issue about mobility uh, is indeed um, an important one. Uh, obviously, I'm aware in terms of transport uh, in the borders, the areas uh, that she uh, represents, that Transport Scotland um, is currently looking at a borders transport corridors uh, project that's a sort of pre uh, application stage um, and you know Transport Scotland will have obligations uh, to think about you know the needs of older people um, as well as perhaps people with uh, disabilities uh, as, 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 as well but we'll keep the, the member informed of our work in social isolation because I think it's uh, relevant uh, as is the work that the Transport Minister leads. Question number 10, June McAlpine. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to reports that two-thirds of people with epilepsy have had their PIP benefits downgraded or denied, with some consequently reporting suicidal feelings. Minister Jean Freeman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The rollout of PIP has indeed been beset by delays, has led to many people having to undergo stressful assessments, and for many people, their claim for PIP has been downgraded or denied, as outlined yet again by, the, by Epilepsy Action. Our response is repeatedly to call on the UK Government to halt the rollout of PIP in Scotland. We're not the only ones. Many organisations have also said the rollout should be halted. Most recently, in terms of the UK programme, the UN Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which specifically called for a review of PIP regulations. But the UK Government uh, continues to roll out PIP. Here in Scotland, this government is committing to building a rights-based social security system, uh, which is precisely what we're currently undertaking. Jim McAlpine. I thank the Minister for that answer. Does she agree that these statistics only go to highlight the abject failure of the UK Government's running of the social security system? And can she set out exactly how the Scottish Government plan to do things differently, particularly in regard to the assessment process under the new Scottish social security system? Minister. I thank the member for that additional question. Um, I do agree, uh, which is why I've made a number of commitments uh, in regard to uh, assessments in particular, including a clear commitment that profit-making companies will not be involved in delivering health assessments for disability benefits and that we will end the revolving door of repeat assessments. The expert group chaired by Dr Jim McCormick of the Joseph Rowntree Foundation have been specifically tasked by me to work out the detail of our assessment process, drawing on views from our experience panels so that we gather the information required at first decision-making point and consequently reduce the need for the number of one-to-one -one health assessments. Thank you. And that concludes portfolio questions. We now move on to our next item of business, which is a statement. Just take a few moments for members to change seats.